around the country visiting and uh, understanding the American people. And, uh, and we just uh, appreciate uh, his uh, passion of service. And, uh, and so, Dean, thank you for coming back. And, uh, and in, indeed, um, Congresswoman Kathy Manning did a really good job as the uh, substitute. And so uh, uh, we're very fortunate. And indeed, it indicates something that people, the American people need to know. And that is that um, Republicans and Democrats can work together. And uh, in fact, on this issue, I'm confident uh, that Republicans and Democrats want what is best for the people of Pakistan. Uh, with that in mind, since the catastrophic withdrawal from Afghanistan in 2021, the region has been stuck in a cycle of instability. Now that instability is further ex exacerbated by the domestic situation uh, within Pakistan, I was born with an appreciation of the people of Pakistan and South Asia. My father had served in the Flying Tigers, the 14th Air Force, in World War II. And he actually arrived in Karachi on his way to serve in Kunming, Chengdu, and Xi'an in China during World War II. But, so he had his beginning service right there in Pakistan. He told me how hardworking the people of South Asia are. And when South uh, Asians began buying, uh, purchasing uh, properties, uh, of hotels and motels across the state of South Carolina, I let them know that I knew who they were, I knew their reputation of hard work, and so I had the opportunity to represent people of South Asia as they was bought a majority of the hotels and motels, convenience stores uh, across uh, the United States. And they have achieved. South Asians now have a per capita income twice that of the average American. Uh, this is just uh, such a tribute to the hardworking talents of the people of South Asia. And then I also had the opportunity to uh, see the uh, military cooperation between the U.S. Marines and uh, the Pakistani military. I had the opportunity to visit a field hospital in Muzaffarabad uh, several years ago after the earthquake. And it was so inspiring to see uh, female doctors uh, working with women who would uh, only go uh, to a, a female physician. Uh, and while I was there, one of the highlights of my service, uh, a young corporal, uh, Solani, came uh, running up and said, hey, Congressman, I'm here because of you. And I thought, gosh, what did I do wrong to send you to uh, a earthquake trouble area? Well, he identified himself, uh, Corporal Solani, and he said, hey, uh, and I, I realized, I remember that our office had expedited his citizenship. Uh, he was a Pakistani-American who uh, could serve in the U.S. Marine Corps, be there uh, in a U.S. Marine uniform, speaking Urdu, uh, how uh, impressive that is. But it, it reinforced to me, again, the uh, positive relationship, the mutually beneficial relationship between the United States and uh, Pakistan. And this was a young Marine who had been trained in the district I represent at Paris Island, South Carolina. And then on my visits to Islamabad, I've been uh, so uh, impressed and inspired by the people that I've had the opportunity to meet, government officials and military. Sadly, uh, part of my visit uh, have been very sad in that I visited a superstar, and that is uh, Benazir Bhutto. Uh, it was so impressive to be at her home. Uh, and then tragically, uh, several weeks later, she was assassinated, which is a reminder uh, over and over again, the destabilization that has been so catastrophic for the people of Pakistan uh, I know that the people of America want a stable, positive, and democratic uh, Pakistan. Pakistan currently is on the brink of uh, economic catastrophe, much of which has been caused by the massive amounts of debt owed to a loan shark. The loan shark is the Chinese Communist Party. We are seeing a cautionary tale play out, where the United States shifted our attention away from Central Asia and South Asia from Pakistan the Chinese Communist Party stepped in to fill the void and in doing so further destabilized the situation. Threats to democracy in Pakistan extend beyond economic threat posed by the Chinese Communist Party presence. Just last month, there were widespread allegations of fraud and interference in the Pakistani elections. This is a critical point in defining the history of Pakistan, where the country must choose between respecting democracy with rule of law, or allow a military establishment to continue to control the direction of the government with rule of gun. 
The Pakistani people deserve to have their voices heard. They deserve democracy and strong institutions. They deserve a government that protects their rights. We have recently seen the threat posed by dictators with rule of gun invading democracy's rule of law. War criminal Putin into Ukraine, the Iranian puppets uh, into Israel, the threats to the people of Taiwan, the actual uh, invasion, sadly, even of the United States on the southern border. We now have recognized that consistently supporting the people of Ukraine and Israel fight back against the malign influence of war criminal Putin and the terrorists supported by the regime in Tehran. We must support the people of Pakistan in their struggle for strong democratic institutions the same way to support the values and American interests which are mutually beneficial to Pakistan and America. I thank Secretary Liu for coming today to discuss the Biden administration's policy toward Pakistan. I look forward to hearing from ranking member Dean Phillips. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to you, Assistant Secretary Liu, for joining us, and to all of you uh, who are joining us today for a robust discussion about the recent election in Pakistan and also the future of the U.S.-Pakistan relationship, uh, which is of great importance uh, to this country and, of course, uh, Pakistan. On February 8th, over 60 million Pakistanis voted in countrywide elections. These elections saw record numbers of women, religious and ethnic minority groups, and young people running for seats in parliament. It resulted in a range of political parties winning seats in national and provincial assemblies. Despite these successes, the United States and international election observers have expressed concerns related to both pre-election and day of election irregularities, including the undue restrictions on freedom of expression, association, and assembly. The US and like-minded countries have also condemned electoral violence, attacks on media workers, and restrictions on access to the internet and telecom services. It is important that any claims of fraud or interference be fully and transparently investigated in accordance with Pakistan's own laws and procedures. And I'm eager to hear from the Assistant Secretary regarding his assessment of that election if the outcome was credible, and how the election fits into Pakistan's historical context. It is also important that the United States-Pakistan relationship remain strong and rooted in our shared commitments to strengthening Pakistan's democratic institutions, supporting Pakistan's economy, cooperating with, on counterterrorism threats, and bolstering respect for human rights. In addition to promoting democratic values, supporting Pakistan's economy is a key strategic goal of our bilateral relationship. After facing one of the worst economic crises in its history, Pakistan and the International Monetary Fund just signed a $3 billion standby arrangement in 2023 that is set to end this April. Prior to this agreement, Pakistan's economy was marked by soaring inflation, a sharply depreciating currency, dwindling foreign exchange reserves, and mounting overseas debt. To achieve fiscal stability and secure a longer-term IMF bailout, Pakistan will have to make structural economic reforms that will include controlling inflation and expanding the collection of the country's tax base. I do hope to hear from Assistant Secretary Liu's perspective on the new coalition government's willingness to work with the IMF and tackle Pakistan's very tough economic challenges in a serious and meaningful way. Terrorism and security challenges are also top of mind when it comes to the U.S.-Pakistan bilateral relationship. Twelve militant organizations operating in Pakistan are designated FTOs, foreign terrorist organizations, under U.S. law. The most prominent, of course, being Tariq Ili Taliban, or the TTB, uh, the Balochistan uh, Liberation Army, Al-Qaeda, and ISIS Khorzon province. The United States has an interest in working with Pakistan to ensure that these organizations are unable to destabilize the region or attack the United States homeland, particularly since the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan in August of 2021, Pakistan has faced an increased domestic threat from the TTP. In 2023, TTP-led bombings and gun attacks killed over 1,000 Pakistanis nationwide, half of them security forces, marking the highest number of fatalities in six years. And just yesterday, the Pakistani government conducted air raids inside of Afghanistan. It claims targeting TTP hideouts in the country. This comes in direct response to a suicide bombing targeting a Pakistani military checkpoint that killed at least seven Pakistani soldiers. Beyond the threat of terrorism and Pakistan's approach to Afghanistan, 
I hope that we will also examine Pakistan's regional relationships with Iran, Russia, and of course China. I'm also deeply disappointed that the former Pakistani government announced that it would expel all unregistered foreigners from the country. Pakistan is home to an estimated 4 million Afghan citizens, and approximately 1.7 million of those are undocumented. This leaves almost 2 million, 2 million people at risk of being deported back to a country under Taliban control that is facing prolonged economic crisis that has left two-thirds of the entire population in need, dire need, of humanitarian assistance. What's more, many of these individuals have lived in Pakistan for decades, having originally fled Afghanistan in the 1980s during the country's occupation by the Soviets. Credible claims that Pakistani authorities have committed widespread abuse against Afghans living in Pakistan to compel their return to Afghanistan are extremely alarming. I recognize and am incredibly grateful for the important work that the State Department and the Pakistani government have done together to ensure that Afghans with a potential pathway to the United States or other international partner countries are able to remain in Pakistan while their cases are adjudicated. I hope Secretary Liu is able to speak to this as well. Pakistan and the U.S. celebrated 75 years of bilateral diplomatic relations just in 2022. Although it's important we continue to address the urgent issues I've mentioned so far, I envision progress towards more robust cooperation on global challenges, such as health and climate, technology, and trade. Pakistan consistently ranks among the top 10 most vulnerable countries on the CRI, the Climate Risk Index, with 10,000 annual fatalities due to climate-related disasters and financial losses amounting to $4 billion annually. In July of 23, USAID announced over $16 million in additional development and humanitarian assistance to support the resilience of communities in Pakistan that experienced 2022's historically devastating floods. These areas of cooperation highlight the work that we can do together to strengthen our communities and combat climate change uh, as two peoples. We also have the opportunity to deepen our people-to-people -people ties, strengthen Pakistan's business environment, and invest in innovative solutions to global health and clean energy. The opportunities for cooperation are endless, as we understand from elections both in the United States and Pakistan also. A government empowered by a strong democratic mandate is critical to addressing long-standing challenges and pursuing new opportunities. I look forward to hearing from Assistant Secretary Liu about all the ways in which the U.S.-Pakistan relationship can advance our shared interests and continue to promote and strengthen respect for democratic values and human rights. With that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Ranking Member Dean Phillips. And uh, it's really unprecedented, but to show how important uh, the relationship is between the United States and Pakistan, we have an unprecedented number of members of Congress who are not on the subcommittee who are requesting to have the opportunity to participate. And so I ask unanimous consent that the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Kassar, and the gentleman from California, Mr. Khanna, be allowed <coughs> to sit at the dais and to participate following all other members at today's hearing without objection so ordered. Additionally, I ask unanimous consent that the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Pfluger, be allowed to sit at the dais and to uh, participate in today's hearing without objection so ordered. And most unprecedented uh, to show how important this hearing is uh, and the relationship and appreciation and affection we have for the people of uh, Pakistan, I now will be recognizing the chairman of the full committee, Congressman Mike McCall of Texas, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, and I, I agree with you. There is a, a tremendous amount of interest uh, in this hearing. I think uh, uh, I've never had so many members on the House floor come to me and say, we need to have a hearing on Pakistan after the election. And I know the diasporas out in, uh, across the United States um, have uh, shown a lot of great interest and have voiced that to their members of Congress. Um, I also want to thank Assistant uh, Secretary Liu for testifying here today. Um, I've always thought Pakistan's a very important country, and I've been there many times. It's a beautiful country, but it's often uh, uh, fraught with problems. Uh, they just installed a new government after this controversial election. Currently, Pakistan is experiencing a massive economic crisis, including record inflation and an overwhelming foreign debt. Pakistan's domestic situation has a ripple effect throughout the region. It is critical the United States works to promote economic prosperity and domestic stability within Pakistan. 
And I think the people of Pakistan deserve a country where democracy and rule of law are protected at the highest levels. The voters have displayed their commitment to participating in the process, despite allegations of fraud and interference in the recent election, the people of Pakistan showed up to vote in unprecedented numbers, which is very positive. Um, however, I was deeply concerned by well-documented instances of interference in the February elections, including a terrorist attack at a candidate's political office's uh, hours before the polls opened. Um, and, and also a major internet and cell service shutoffs on election day. These events are serious and consequential. I've called for a full investigation in any allegations of interference uh, or corruption in their recent elections. And I'll be watching closely to see how these irregularities are being addressed. Additionally, human rights in Pakistan must be respected for democracy to thrive. The failure to recognize basic human rights will unquestionably lead to a downward spiral. If human rights are ignored, the prospect of a democratic society will evaporate. Meanwhile, Pakistan's security is at risk as the TTP and other terror groups have become increasingly emboldened. This is a direct result of the Biden administration's disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan in 2021. And we had a hearing just yesterday with the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Milley, and CENTCOM commander, General McKenzie. That deadly and chaotic withdrawal projected weakness on the world stage. And we see from history that weakness always invites aggression. Our adversaries are now testing our resolve. And when they see weakness, they do exploit it. Pakistan has played an essential role in mitigating the effects of the administration's withdrawal on regional security. It remains vitally important that the United States and Pakistan continue to work together to counter terrorism. While challenges remain ahead, the United States and Pakistan must continue to work together to promote regional stability. We also know that if the United States pulls away from our relationship with Pakistan, the Chinese Communist Party will gain even more influence. And while we seek to help nations thrive, CCP is only interested in a one-way relationship of debt trap diplomacy. And Pakistan and their ground zero for their uh, Belt and Road Initiative uh, Pakistan is the CCP's ground zero uh, for, you know, China's Belt and Road. Uh, so anyway, I look forward to working with my colleagues. It's our, in our best interest to have a vibrant and healthy Pakistan, one of democracy, economic prosperity, and stability. And I think working together, we can work to make Pakistan a success in its role as a key regional security partner. And so that, again, Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this hearing. I know there's immense interest in this across the nation and, of course, in Pakistan itself. And with that, I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank you yesterday for the historic hearing that you conducted with General Mark Milley and General Frank McKinsey, uh, revealing clearly that uh, President Biden uh, did not uh, abide by their recommendations that the withdrawal, the uh, surrender, the appeasement was solely the responsibility of Mr. Biden. With that in mind, we're pleased to have our distinguished witness today, the Honorable Donald Liu, Assistant Secretary for South and Central Asian Affairs at the State Department. Thank you for being here today. Your full statement will be made part of the record, and I'll ask you to keep your spoken remarks to five minutes in order to allow time for members to ask questions, and they too will be held to a strict five minutes. I now recognize Assistant Secretary Liu for the opening statement. Chairman Wilson, Ranking Member Phillips, Chairman McCall, colleagues. When I was a junior officer in Peshawar, Pakistan 31 years ago, I got to see a Pakistani election up close. I got to see the irregularities in that election, but also the courage of the Pakistani people 
to come out and vote despite threats of intimidation and threats of violence. If you'll allow me today, I propose to say a few words about where the election on February 8th fell short, where we saw positive elements, and what lies ahead for U.S. policy in Pakistan. The day after the elections, the State Department issued a clear statement. We noted undue restrictions on the freedoms of expression, association, and peaceful assembly. We condemned the electoral violence and restrictions on human rights and fundamental freedoms. We condemned attacks on media workers and restrictions on the access to the internet and telecom services. And we expressed concern about allegations of interference in the electoral process and stated that claims of interference and fraud should be fully investigated. If you'll allow me, I'll drill down a bit deeper into these observations. We were particularly concerned about electoral abuses and violence that happened in the weeks leading up to the polls. First, there were attacks against police, politicians, and political gatherings by terrorist groups. Second, many journalists, particularly female journalists, were harassed and abused by party supporters. And third, several political leaders were disadvantaged by the inability to register specific candidates and political parties. On the day of elections, an internationally respected local election monitoring organization said they were barred from observing vote tabulation in more than half of the constituencies across the country. And despite a high court order not to interrupt internet service on election day, authorities shut down mobile data services, the principal means by which Pakistanis access social media and messaging apps. There were positive elements to this election as well. Despite the threat of violence, over 60 million Pakistanis voted, including over 21 million women. Voters elected 50% more women to parliament than they had in 2018. In addition to record number of female candidates, there were also a record number of members of religious and minority groups and young people running for seats in their parliament. Pakistani voters had a choice a range of political parties won seats in the national and provincial assemblies. Three different political parties now lead Pakistan's four provinces. More than 5,000 independent election observers were in the field. Their organization's conclusion was that the conduct of the election was largely competitive and orderly while noting some irregularities in the compilation of results. Pakistan is an important partner of the U.S. We share a commitment to strengthening Pakistan's democratic institutions, supporting the U.S.-Pakistan Green Alliance framework, cooperating to counter terrorist threats from groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS, and bolstering respect for human rights, including the right of religious freedom. Most importantly, the United States plays a critical role in promoting economic stability in Pakistan. We are the top destination for Pakistan's exports. We have been one of the most important investors in critical infrastructure over 76 years of our partnership. For example, the U.S. government is refurbishing now the Mangala and Tarbella dams, which provide electricity to tens of millions of Pakistanis. Our support for Pakistan over these decades has been in the form of development grants, private sector investment, and humanitarian assistance during the periods of its greatest need, including the recent catastrophic flooding. Unfortunately, Pakistan is facing mounting, a mounting debt challenge after the past decade of elevated borrowing, including from the PRC. This year, nearly 70% of the federal government's revenue is expected to go to payments to service this massive debt. Pakistan needs economic reforms, and it needs private sector-led investment that will deliver economic growth for the Pakistani people and not dig their government deeper into debt. Finally, Pakistani people deserve a country that is peaceful, that is democratic, and that is prosperous. We are working every day to support that vision. I thank the subcommittee for, I thank the subcommittee for its leadership on developing our relations with Pakistan, and I pledge to work with its members uh, as we execute our policy. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. You were precisely on time. 
And so, and Alexis is going to make sure that we're all five minutes. And I, I want to uh, commend Chairman McCall again. We now have uh, clocks that are large enough for people of age to read. So this is a really startling discovery here. <laughs> the um, we, we've really come. Hey, we've come a long way to have clocks you can read. Um, but uh, no, this is so uh, so horrific. But um, not not only is it catastrophic to the people of Pakistan, but it's a message to other countries uh, that um, think that they're working uh, with. Uh, people that they can trust. They're not. They're there for a purpose, and the time needs to begin on mine now, please. And so, um, the, uh, as we begin, after the disastrous U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan and with the 13 murdered Marines at Abbey Gate uh, in 2021, where does the administration see the future of the U.S.-Pakistan relationship? What are the administration's top priorities for Pakistan? Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, and again, thank you for holding this hearing. It's obviously of great interest uh, for Americans generally. Clearly, uh, in the audience today, we have lots of people who care deeply about Pakistan. Uh, we, we are at an inflection point in our relationship with Pakistan. As you suggest, uh, uh, Afghanistan has been in conflict for 40 years, and Pakistan has been a country that has been caught up in that conflict. The end of the war in Afghanistan provides us all an opportunity, an opportunity to have a relationship with Pakistan on its own terms. And we are committed to doing that. One of the major goals that we have with Pakistan now is to support the Pakistani people as they face this terrible threat of terrorism. Many of the members have discussed this, but this is a country where the people have suffered um, under the threat of terrorism in a way that I, I think no one on the planet has had to suffer. The attacks, particularly in the provinces of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and Baluchistan, over the past three years have grown exponentially. We, we continue to see attacks being uh, launched from Afghan territory. And you saw uh, a major attack on Saturday in which seven uh, policemen were killed uh, it, by the TTP, the Pakistani Taliban, uh, and we call on the Afghan Taliban to ensure that its territory is not used as a launching pad for terrorist groups. Second, we're very focused on economic um, stability for Pakistan. For Pakistan to deal with its social terrorism and political issues, it needs a functioning economy. And we want private sector-led growth there. Growth that benefits the Pakistani people, not growth which fuels um, profits by uh, lender countries like the PRC. And lastly, we have a long partnership people to people with Pakistan. We want to see that grow. We want to see business to business relations improve. We want to see the ease of Pakistani Americans to travel to Pakistan and Pakistanis to travel to the United States. Those ties are critical. Uh, I have two children in university right now. We have many, many Pakistani friends as they've grown up, but also in university. We want to see those numbers expand. Thank you. And, and indeed, I'm glad you, uh, the Pakistani-American diaspora is so important. And uh, they've been so successful as entrepreneurs uh, here in our country. And we want that, them to send a message back of how free market capitalism uh, has such a positive consequence uh, for, for the people of Pakistan. Mr. Secretary, there have been unsubstantiated allegations that the you know, U.S. government has conspired to re remove Prime Minister Imran Khan from power. What is your assessment of these untrue uh, speculations? Mr. Chairman, I want to be very clear on this point. These allegations, these, this conspiracy theory is a lie. It is a complete falsehood. I have reviewed the press reporting related to this, what it's called the cipher in Pakistan, the alleged leak diplomatic cable uh, from the embassy here. It is not accurate. It at no point, at no point does it accuse the United States government or me personally of taking steps against Imran Khan. And thirdly, the other person in the meeting, the then ambassador of Pakistan to the United States, has testified to his own government 
that there was no conspiracy. We respect the sovereignty of Pakistan. We respect the principle that Pakistan, Pakistani people should be the only ones choosing their own leaders through a democratic process. Mr. Chairman, we are grateful that you are holding this hearing today for us to talk about that process. Thank you. And hey, your response is so good because it's so clear that you're correct. And we appreciate so much uh, your clarity on the issue. And good people, uh, indeed, you make a difference. So God bless you. Thank you. And with that, I now recognize the ranking member, uh, Dean Phillips. The chair notes a disturbance of the committee proceedings. The room will be in order. And we now proceed with Congressman Dean Phillips. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Liu, I, I appreciate your observations on the recent election, both the positive elements and also the challenges. Uh, in the State Department's post-election statement, uh, the indication was the United States is going to work with the next Pakistani government regardless of the party. I just want to clarify that that has always been the case, correct? Yes, sir. And the department has also expressed concerns about human rights and democracy in Pakistan where appropriate, but has never taken a position on who should lead an elected government in Pakistan. Is that correct? That is correct. And the department's statement also noted that claims of interference or fraud should be fully investigated. And since that aspect of the statement has gotten a lot of play in the Pakistani press and on social media, could you elaborate on what was intended by that statement? Representative Phillips, um, the Pakistani people, uh, through their constitution, have created a system by which um, the Election Commission of Pakistan hears the complaints of Pakistani people, of candidates, and political parties to render judgments about election irregularities. We, as a partner of Pakistan, have called for that to be done transparently and fully, and for the account for those. Held, uh, found responsible for irregularities to be held accountable, we can see a process whereby that's happening. The Election Commission of Pakistan has formed a high-level committee, which is now sifting through thousands of petitions from people across Pakistan who have complained about the very same things that we have noted in our statement. We will be monitoring that process very closely. We will be encouraging the government and the Election Commission to make sure that that is a fully transparent process with the Pakistani public. Do not recognize this. Yes. Mr. 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 Liu, if, if Mr. Liu, if you if you might if you just might move your microphone just a little close, it's a little hard for uh, some of us to hear too. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, this is not Pakistan related per se, but it is your area of responsibility. So I want to ask also about India. Um, I know the administration is looking at accountability. Uh, for the alarming allegations that a government of India official was connected to a murder for hire plot targeting a Sikh American here on American soil in New York City. Uh, the administration, of course, recently placed sanctions on more than 500 individuals relating to the killing of Alexei Navalny in Russia on Russian soil. So my question is, are any similar sanctions on tra or travel bans being considered for those who we believe may be responsible for the attempted murder of Mr. Panan? Thank you, Representative Phillips. Uh, this is a serious issue, a serious issue between the United States and India. Uh, the Department of Justice has alleged that um, an Indian citizen, at the behest of someone working in the Indian government, has attempted to kill an American citizen on American soil. Uh, we, we take this in the administration uh, at, uh, incredibly seriously and have raised it at the highest levels with India. We are, at the moment, um, working with India to encourage India to hold accountable those responsible for this, um, this terrible crime. What we can see is that India itself has announced that they have created a committee of inquiry to look into this matter, and we ask them to work quickly and transparently to make sure justice is done. 
Thank you. Uh, with the remainder of my time, I'd like to talk about economic issues. Uh, if you could give an assessment of the current economic situation in Pakistan, of course, a growing economy is good for stability. It's good for this partnership and trade. Uh, I know it's still early, but uh, if you could provide an assessment of how you see things right now, I'd appreciate it. Uh, no, not only is it really important for the Pakistani people that they have economic stability and economic growth, it's important for America. Mm -hmm. We have lots of investments in Pakistan. There are lots of franchises and American businesses working throughout Pakistan. Their success is our success. One of the issues I think that we face uh, with the Pakistani economy is a, a real difficulty to invest and to trade there. We are calling on Pakistan to reform many of the ways it does business with foreign partners. And in doing that, they will attract American investment, but they'll also attract investment from the Pakistani private sector. Pakistani investors are smart. They want to work in a place where they can make money. Mm -hmm. And so some of the things that we're calling for are reform of the regulations that will allow repatriation of profits out of the country, um, uh, cutting down on bureaucratic red tape, and more predictable regulations. If Pakistan is willing to do that, I think you'll see large numbers of American investors flocking to Pakistan. It's a really interesting place to invest if it had the right conditions. All right. Thank you, sir. And with that, I yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Ranking Member Dean Phillips. We now proceed to Congressman Rich McCormick of Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to uh, point out that we in Congress uh, have a job to do. This is an incredibly important topic. And I think out of respect for those people who are interested in this topic, the people who want to be disruptive should be gaveled out and removed from this hearing. I think anybody who's earned this place, whether you be in Congress or be a military member or be somebody from Pakistan or be somebody who's interested in this topic should be respected. And those people who break the rules should be removed from and not be allowed back in in future because this continues to waste our time. And with that, I'm going to uh, move with your permission, Chair, to have these people removed before I, I continue. Uh, so ordered. Thank you. All three that were speaking out, thank you. They're wearing red in case you can't figure out who they are. The committee will suspend while the Capitol Police restore order. And uh, Congressman McCormick will now continue with his full five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've been interrupted in the previous uh, hearings, and I just want to make sure we, we have some order. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you, and I thank you, Secretary Liu, for your testimony today. Today's topic is very important to me. Whether we like it or not, the U.S. future cannot include isolationism from the rest of the world. American leadership will be required for our country's future success and to ensure America remains first in the world. We must remain robust partnerships and alliances alliances with nations that share our interests and values. As nations like China and Russia and violent extremist organizations threaten global stability, it is critical for U.S. interests for South Central Asia countries such as Pakistan and India to continue developing stable and transparent democracies. That's why I introduced House Resolution 901 with my esteemed colleague from Michigan, Representative Dan Kildee. The resolution affirms U.S support for democracy and human rights in Pakistan. I'm looking forward to HRES 901's consideration later this afternoon as the House Foreign Affairs Committee marks it up. As I am sure you're aware, Pakistan recently conducted the largest election in its history, but these were unfortunately marred by allegations of fraudulent activity and electoral violence. Watchdog groups raised the alarm over reports of political repression, suspension of interest access on election day, delays in election results, and more. Currently, the Election Commission of Pakistan is reviewing many of the election results in individual parliamentary 
constituencies, and the Pakistani judicial system is investigating and adjudicating, adjudicating irregularities. In fact, the ambassador from Pakistan came to my office yesterday and talked about what they were going to try to do to mitigate these problems. With all this being said, there must be full, credible, and independent audit of these election results. Secretary Liu, do you think and the State Department have confidence in Pakistan's judicial process and its ability to adjudicate claims of wrongdoing? Thank you, Representative McCormick. Uh, if I might, just before I answer that question, just say a word about uh, protests. We have just tremendous respect for the Pakistani American community. Um, we we uh, pride ourselves in the State Department and in my office about talking to um, Pakistani Americans because they are the people in our vast country who care the most about this relationship. They have something genuine to offer because of their deep knowledge and, and the deep concern they have of the future of the country. And so I, I, I want to join the voices of this committee to say how important their involvement is, how much we respect them. We try to listen to them at every opportunity. I hope they are also listening to all of you and to those of us who are trying to guide this policy. Absolutely, well, and I will say, respectful conversation is always paramount for me. I've met with constituencies. I have people who've come here from all over the United States that I've met with in my own district on this topic. There is a time and a place for everyone to speak, and that's order, that's something that we worked hard for. Well, one of the things that I have faced over these last two years is some of these allegations, unfounded allegations, have resulted in regular damage of acceptability. And I do think, at times, some of the free speech has verged into threats of violence, which is not acceptable in our society. Sir, if I could answer your important question. Um, the Election Commission of Pakistan, in past elections, has rerun elections where there have been a finding of uh, electoral abuse. We have seen that over and over. In fact, in this election, they have already ordered the rerun of elections where there has been violence. As we know, there have been candidates who have been killed in this election. There have been some terrible uh, violence that preceded the election. We call on the Election Commission to fulfill its constitutional role in Pakistan to be the watchdog over these elections and to act in a nonpartisan way. We all will be watching this process very, very closely. As to whether they will do it, it's up to the Pakistani people to make sure their institutions are functional and that are upholding their constitution. Thank you. And do you think that the Pakistani government has the ability to continue to improve and be accountable and be a good partner going forward uh, as the United States needs them to be in that region? Pakistan is such an important partner of ours. They are a major non-NATO ally. We have deep national security interests with Pakistan, not least of which is the fight against terrorism. Not only terrorism that affects Pakistanis, but terrorism that affects Americans. And Pakistan has been a partner in our resettling of Afghan refugees to whom we owe a debt. And we are grateful to the people and the government of Pakistan for that cooperation. Thank you, sir. How are you? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Congressman Rich McCormick of Georgia. We now proceed to Congresswoman Kathy Manning of North Carolina. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome back to my good friend, Dean Phillips. And thank you, Assistant Secretary Liu, for your service to our country. I want to focus on the plight of women in Pakistan for a few minutes. I am very concerned about the treatment of women in Pakistan, including female journalists and women harassed and, erect, and arrested at protests and rallies leading up to the election. As you, as you know, Pakistan is routinely rated near the bottom of the world in terms of women's inclusion, justice, safety, and security. So can you talk to us about how the State Department is working to address gender-based violence and highlight and improve the safety, the rights, the inclusion, and representation of women in Pakistan's democracy? Representative Manning, such an important question. I wish I had my wife here sitting next to me. I met my wife in Pakistan. She was an American refugee worker working with Afghans, but her um, her academic subject matter uh, of specialty is gender-based violence, and she has worked in Pakistan on this very issue. What I would say about Pakistan, its human rights, um, the rights of women, I, I say about many countries, but I, I really mean it, which is we as foreign partners aren't going to be able to change Pakistan. 
Who will change Pakistan? Pakistani people will. And we see that very strong desire of women across Pakistan to be heard, to be represented, and to have their rights respected by the institutions of government as well as by the rest of society. I see great victories in Pakistan every day. Um, there have, as I mentioned, double the number of women elected to this parliament. And do you, see, do you see that as a, as a positive um, moment that will actually give hope and perhaps achieve new things for women in Pakistan? I, I see the emergence of female leaders in Pakistan at every level as being the examples that will lead their society forward. You, you are entirely right. At the village level in Pakistan, lives for women are incredibly dif difficult. I see more women today in senior positions in business. I see them on the high court. I see them in parliament. I see them as ministers. Uh, honestly, some days Pakistanis are doing better than Americans on some of these questions. It is a struggle for all of us, but I do credit the very brave women and young girls who are leading this path uh, in Pakistan. And I think as foreign partners, we need to put our resources, our public statements, and our activism behind Pakistani female leaders. And can you give us some idea of the percentage of participation of Pakistani women in the economy? And are there hurdles to greater participation? And is there anything we can do to encourage greater participation? Well, one of the real issues for every business in Pakistan, but particularly for women-owned businesses, is access to financing. And so one of the things that I've seen over the course of my career, uh, and, and particularly in Pakistan, is the emergence of these microfinance projects, because largely women-owned interests uh, businesses are not the massive textile mills or the steel plants. They're small businesses. They're businesses run out of homes or small shops in local communities. If women have access to that financing, women will succeed in business. USAID, the EU, the United Kingdom, Japan, Australia, many, many of Pakistan's donor friends are investing in those types of businesses, while the PRC and other countries are investing in literally roads to nowhere that bleed the Pakistani people of their resources year after year. So we've certainly talked about giving women access to more uh, financial opportunities in this committee. I hope we will continue to do that in the future. Because you've mentioned China, let me walk into this question with the little time I have left. Um, Pakistan faces a, a, a grave challenge, has faced grave challenges in recent years from flooding, from indebtedness to creditors like China. Um, what more can we do um, to counterbalance what China is doing um, and the debt that they're helping create in Pakistan? We can compete. Where we fail overseas, we are not present. Where we compete, we always win because we have a better offer. We offer private sector-led investment for profit-making enterprises that benefit local people and not just the lender countries. Thank you. My time has expired. I yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Congresswoman Kathy Manning of North Carolina. We'll be proceeding to Congresswoman Mike Lawler in one second. And, uh, even before, I want to uh, thank you for pointing out the different uh, allies uh, working uh, with Pakistan and one that you left out, uh, which is so significant, and that is South Korea. Uh, to go from ashes 60 years ago to be one of the wealthiest countries on earth uh, is uh, an example uh, throughout the Indo-Pacific and the uh, South uh, Asia of um, achieving a per capita income of $44,000 uh, for each citizen. Who would ever imagine? Uh, and I know that Korea has been vitally interested in uh, developing economic ties with the people of Pakistan. With that, we now proceed to Congressman Mike Lawler. Uh, thank you, Mr. Liu. Uh, I know many of my colleagues touched on uh, the election irregularities and some of the concerns about it, so I want to segue uh, a little bit. Uh, just a few weeks ago, the government of Pakistan approved plans to begin construction on a pipeline to transport natural gas from Iran to Pakistan. Iran constructed, uh, constructed its side of the pipeline years ago, and now Pakistan has finally decided to move forward. Uh, Mr. Liu, do you view this pipeline as Pakistan aligning itself uh, with Iran? 
I mean, it's a really interesting question, Representative Lawler, because Pakistan and Iran just traded missile and drone strikes a few weeks ago. So um, it has um, been true over time that Pakistan and Iran have had ups and downs in their relationship. They're at a pretty low point today. We are tracking this uh, planned pipeline between Iran and Pakistan. Honestly, I don't know where the financing for such a project would come from. I don't think many international um, donors would be interested in funding such an endeavor. We've also not heard from the government of Pakistan a desire for um, any a waiver of American sanctions that would certainly result from such a project. Instead, what we are undertaking in the administration is to have a conversation with Pakistan. What are Pakistan's other alternatives? How can we compete for that business? Where can they find other non-Iranian sources of natural gas? And how can we help Pakistan think about the transition to clean energy? Pakistan's very interested in uh, providing energy through solar, through wind, through hydro. How can that begin to replace their uh, dependence on coal and other hydrocarbons? Okay. Um, so have you expressed direct concern with the pa Pakistani government on this issue? We are in consultation with the Pakistani government on this issue, yes, sir. Okay. Um, I mean, my concern is that Iran is the greatest state sponsor of terror. They use the illicit Iranian petroleum uh, oil trade uh, to finance terrorism. Uh, since Joe Biden took office, nearly $88 billion in increased revenue uh, has resulted because of lax enforcement on sanctions. Uh, it's why I introduced the SHIP Act uh, to increase secondary sanctions on uh, the purchase of Iranian petroleum. Uh, it passed through the House overwhelmingly with bipartisan support and has since stalled in the Senate uh, because the White House doesn't want it. Uh, so from my vantage point, when we talk about other alternatives that uh, Pakistan may be able uh, to engage on, why don't we start by cracking down on the illicit oil trade? Why is the administration taking a very lax approach to cracking down on Iranian petroleum? Sir, um, the administration will uphold both the letter and the spirit of all sanction laws, particularly those related to you Iran. You think an increase of $88 billion in revenue is upholding the letter and spirit of the law? Sir, I, I, I am not an expert in Iranian energy exports, but what I know as a person who has a car that's fueled by gasoline is all of us have paid for higher gasoline after Putin's uh, full-scale invasion of Ukraine. And I... Well, what, that's also sir, a result in this country of us limiting uh, production of oil and natural gas in this country. That's why we're dealing with our own energy challenges. Sir, but if, across I can, the globe, if I could answer your question, I... I across the, well, you went in a... ...from happening. We are working towards that goal, sir. Okay. How does the administration view Pakistan's relationship with the Taliban? With suspicion, sir. And so what are we doing uh, based on that suspicion? So I think it is well known that um, previous governments of Pakistan have had close relations with the Taliban. Currently, the greatest terrorist threat faced by the people of Pakistan emanates from Afghanistan. And the relationship between Pakistan and the Taliban is about the same as the relationship between the United States and the Taliban. It is very strained and difficult. We have a very important dialogue with the Pakistani government about the Taliban, how to help shape its behavior, how to help make sure the Taliban upholds its commitments. Last question, why was the why was Pakistan excluded from the administration's Indo-Pacific strategy? Sir, it, it, it's um, a way that we define the Indo-Pacific, and it's not only this administration, it's the last administration as well. For whatever reason, I suspect it has to do with COCOM authority between the Indo-Pacific Command and Central Command. The dividing line of the Indo-Pacific is a, the line between Pakistan and India. Well. Time is up. I have to cut you off, Mr. Lou. There's a new sheriff in town. It's me. I recognize um, the sheriff's authority.
Brad Sherman from California, you're recognized, sir. We have substantial leverage in Pakistan in two ways. First, the IMF, where we have a loud voice and we should use it more often. And second, we could deny visas uh, to high-ranking Pakistani officials. Uh, we need to focus on human rights in Pakistan. Uh, I'm particularly focused on, on Sindh and the disappearances there, the forced conversions of young girls uh, forced to convert uh, and then marry old men. And uh, uh, we've seen uh, uh, the, uh, throughout Pakistan a blasphemy law that uh, uh, allows a person to complain, and all of a sudden someone who's not Muslim usually is uh, subject to detention and even execution. Uh, but the greatest problem is Dr. Afridi. That is something we discussed in this room last decade again and again. He's in jail for 14 years. We released Victor Aboot to get an American back. And the message to everyone in the world, and this is a national security th risk, is don't cooperate with the CIA. Because if you're an American national, we'll move heaven and earth to get you out. But if you're the one foreign national who did the most for America of anyone this century, you will rot in jail. The Pakistanis have said that they will uh, do a Siddiqui for a freedy trade. Uh, Ms. Siddiqui, uh, didn't kill any Americans, tried to, ought to be in jail, ha is, is now perhaps uh, in, uh, incapacitated anyway. Will we trade Siddiqui for Afridi? And if not, will we uh, 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 ban from entry into this country those who are holding her hostage, uh, Dr. Afridi hostage? Or do we just turn our back on any foreign national? The man who is responsible for getting bin Laden is in a Pakistani jail. Mr. Mr. Secretary. Chairman, um, I, I um, first want to thank you personally, but also thank this committee and the Congress. Sir, I have one. Th I will advocacy. yield ten seconds to say, Siddiqui for Freedy, yes or no. Um, Mr. Chairman, I have been in this job for more than two and a half years. I have never had a Pakistani official raise they, with me. They've told me. Or, they've told your predecessor. They've told the State Department. Freedy's in jail. You haven't done anything about it. And he's the man that helped us get bin Laden. But let's, let, let's move on. Sir, I only get five minutes. Uh, go ahead. You, um, we have the exit control list where hundreds of American citizens are prohibited from leaving Pakistan. Will we treat them the same way we deal with everyone else who's wrongfully detained in Russia and elsewhere? What are we doing to get American citizens who have not been even charged with a crime out of Pakistan if they want to leave. Representative Sherman, we work every day on behalf of American citizens in Pakistan. As you note, there are some laws that have put undue restrictions on Americans. We have had a very positive but track hundreds, record. But hun I mean, hundreds are still there, and the IMF loan goes forward, and the, we allow the top uh, generals in Pakistan to visit the United States when American citizens can't leave Pakistan and come to the United States. We then have the vote tabulation system, um, and they have banned the bat, the symbol of the PTI, then they banned the batsman. And uh, this is, uh, uh, I mean, there have been flaws in other Pakistani elections. But this is uh, perhaps uh, the greatest uh, flaw. Uh, and we're told, and the Pakistani ambassadors told me, well, this is just the ordinary working of the Pakistani judicial system. That's the same judicial system that has Dr. Afridi in jail for 14 years for getting bin Laden. Do we have faith that uh, uh, Imran Khan has not been the victim of selective prosecution? Or is it apparent that he has been? Sir, following the rioting on May 9th, the day Imran Khan was arrested, the United States government has raised our concerns about the mass detention of members of the opposition to include the PTI. We have raised concerns about the use of military there, courts. If, if I can interrupt, there's one thing you need to do. The American ambassador needs to visit Imran Khan in prison and make sure 
that he lives to tell the tale of how he was wrongfully imprisoned uh, through selective prosecution. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Excellent questions. Um, Representative Baird is not here, so I'm the next in line. Um, Secretary Liu, could you provide insight in the involvement of the military in the politics of Pakistan? <laughs> Hold on. Y'all don't need to clap for me. I'm good. I'm good. We're good. Thank y'all. Go ahead, brother. Um, the Pakistani military is the sixth largest military in the world, the largest of any um, majority Muslim country. The U.S. military has historically had very close relations with the Pakistani military. Our generals and their generals have trained together decade after decade. It is an important part of Pakistani culture. I have lived in Pakistan. I have seen that for myself. The Pakistani military is an important institution. We respect, in this administration and all past American administrations, the constitutional principle that the Pakistani military must be kept under civilian control. It must be answerable to the president. But is it? Answerable to the president, sir, who is the commander in chief and responsible to civilian control. Okay. Does, do y'all at the State Department intend to conduct a review of the most recent elections in Pakistan? Sir, we have conducted that review and we have found the, uh, a number of election irregularities that I've detailed today. Right. What we are undertaking right now is a monitoring of how the democratic institutions of Pakistan will address those irregularities. Well, I, would, I would suggest sir, to you that, that a strong letter is not doing a whole heck of a lot. I would tell you that this country needs to start using its economic might to correct some of these wrongs. If these people are being mistreated. I, you know, I, I'm not much on bureaucrats. I don't like writing letters. I like delivering it personally, and I think that's something we could do. Um, did the U.S. ask for former Prime Minister Imran Khan's removal after he visited Russia? Uh, that uh, We did not, sir. Okay. There are people who believe you were involved in the regime change in Pakistan. Can you speak on that? Sir, I was absolutely not involved, nor were any Americans involved with that process. None whatsoever. None whatsoever, sir. Not, not contractors, not? None, not one. Okay. In aid to Pakistan being withheld, uh, is aid to Pakistan being withheld um, because Pakistan refused to vote against the Russian invasion of Ukraine at the United Nations General Assembly? N no, sir. All right. Um, I have a little more time left. Do I have any members? Um, I tell you what. Um, okay. Hang on for a second, Charles. I'm not used to this. All right. Well, I'll, I'll end mine then. Um, I'll, Representative Schneider from Illinois. Uh, thank you, Chairman uh, uh, Burchett. Uh, oh, wait. I'm sorry. It's not you. It's almost. I'm sorry, do y'all want to fight it out or can I? No, go ahead. Okay, I apologize. I'm, I'm new at this. That's why they don't let me do this very often. Well, you're doing a great job, Mr. Chairman. That's just because I recognized you. So go ahead. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to uh, Ranking Member Phillips, and greetings, uh, Assistant Secretary Liu. Uh, I know we've touched on uh, some of the election issues before, but like many other uh, members of this committee, I'm concerned, uh, concerned by the trends, but also concerned by the elections specifically. Uh, as we know, in early February, uh, the elections were held after a nearly three-month delay that raised serious concerns about the democratic process in Pakistan. I, I also know that the State Department joined other international election observers in expressing concern that the election included undue restrictions on freedoms of expression, association, uh, and assembly. So, you know, I want to reiterate my personal concern. Uh, the incoming that I've received has uh, really been uh, uh, illuminating and suggested that there's more that we can do. I can share uh, the, the, the chair's urging in, in uh, his uh, recent uh, remarks that our country uses uh, its levers uh, to, to ensure that uh, democracy uh, is upheld. Um, 
That's also why uh, I'm proud to co-sponsor House Resolution 901. Uh, this resolution reaffirms the House of Representatives' strong support for democracy in Pakistan and urges the government of Pakistan to uphold democracy and protect uh, fundamental rights. But as we you know, look more broadly uh, at human rights in, in Pakistan, uh, the, the State Department, uh, your, your agency's most re recent human rights report, highlighted significant uh, human rights challenges in Pakistan, including restrictions on freedom of expression and freedom of the press. Credible threats of violence, harassment, abductions, and killings by security forces, political parties, and other groups have led citizens and journalists to self-censor uh, their speech for their own safety. The State Department found that the Pakistani government's failure to investigate and prosecute attacks on free speech and the press have effectively led to restrictions on, on, on free speech and the press in a very dramatic way. I, you know, really what I want to hear is how can and how will the United States work with the Pakistani government to support meaningful change to promote freedom of speech and freedom of the press? Sir, I, I have the pleasure and responsibility of reading the Pakistani media on a daily basis. Um, and I will confirm what is in our human rights report is there is both self-censorship and occasionally active censorship in Pakistan today. At the same time, what I read in the Pakistani press is a cacophony of voices. There is actually competition in the media with respect to things that are said and not said, as well as in social media. And so one of the most damaging things that we see today are restrictions on social media, because like the rest of the world, Pakistanis are getting a lot of their news and information through um, the internet. And so when internet get, the internet gets pulled down or X uh, gets throttled as it, as it has been now for several weeks, it denies the Pakistani people from getting the kind of diversity of reporting information that they deserve. We are talking to the Pakistani government at the highest level about these issues. We're also working year after year in the trenches with Pakistani civil society to help to train journalists about fact-checking about responsible um, sourcing of their information, about journalistic standards. And what I can also see is, while there is censorship, both self and active, we can also see the development of some truly excellent journalism coming out of Pakistan, and some very brave journalists who defy um, these censors and still produce um, uh, things that call into question the government, or the military, or the Americans, or any number of other um, institutions of authority. If, if I may, sir, what, what exactly have those conversations yielded uh, with, with the government? Because, I, I mean, it's one thing to have them, but it's another to be pursuing, you know, some outcomes that are beneficial to the values that we uphold here and we want to see in a real active democratic society. I do think it's important for both the administration and the Congress to say loud and clear that we are watching what happens in Pakistan. We're watching closely its human rights record, what it does with respect to religious freedom, and what it's doing on free speech. I grant you, I don't know that what we say today affects exactly what they're going to do tomorrow, but over time, if we let up on these values, it's going to be worse because they can see that there are no consequences for these violations. Well, uh, my time is expiring. The only thing that I want to uh, leave you with is I, I think we, we have a responsibility to make that concern uh, clearer, more active, uh, and, and seek the outcomes that, that, that we believe in in maintaining our democracy. My time has expired. I yes, yield sir. back to the chair. Thank you very much. And uh, it, we now proceed to Congressman Brad Schneider of uh, Illinois. And of course, it's really easy to get confused between uh, Gabe Amo and Amo and uh, Brad Schneider. Uh, they both come from assorted northern states, uh, Rhode Island and now Illinois. Uh, th thank you, Chairman Wilson. And no good deed going unpunished. Uh, Gabe asked the question I wanted to ask, uh, and uh, thank you for your answer. I'm going to build on that. You know, in your written testimony, you concluded that the Pakistani people de deserve a country that is peaceful, democratic, and prosperous. Quotes. 
And I, I, we, we just talked a little bit about what the United States can do, but let me just say here that a peaceful, democratic, and prosperous Pakistan is not just important to the Pakistanis, it's in the interest of the United States as well. And, and that's why we we're having this hearing, and I thank the chairman for, for uh, calling it, and we're addressing what has been discussed, very real concerns about the election, but also recognizing, as you noted in your testimony, the positive elements seen in the election and how we build upon them, and I hope we continue uh, those conversations. I want to shift gears a little bit and touch on uh, Afghan deportations, though. Uh, I share among other, with others the deep concern of these mass deportations of undocumented, uh, undocumented Afghans back to Afghanistan, where they're going to live in horrible humanitarian conditions under the Tanam, uh, Taliban. Uh, Human Rights Watch claims that Pakistani authorities have committed widespread abuses against Afghans living in Pakistan to compel their return to Afghanistan, including by confiscating property, destroying documents, and physically abusing individuals. Has U.S. raised these concerns with the government at all, and how is U.S. working with the international community to push back against this policy? Thank you, sir. Uh, we have had discussions with the Pakistani government at the highest levels about these deportations. As you know, as has been well documented, over half a million Afghans have returned to Afghanistan following this effort by the Pakistani government to remove uh, illegal foreigners. From the first day of that process, we have been in touch with the Pakistani government, both about the humanitarian consequences of this mass deportation, but also to try to protect those Afghans who have a pathway to coming to the United States. There are thousands of Afghans who worked with us, who worked with our embassy or our military, who have fled to Pakistan and sought sanctuary there, we have been very keen that those Afghans are allowed to stay so we can process them. And they're and, still in processing. So and they are. And, and the Pakistani government has actually on this one issue been very supportive. We are grateful for that. On the broader issue, we are talking with the new government now about trying to make sure that the, the rights of Afghan refugees are respected. We are thankful, right, that Pakistani people have hosted over three million Afghan refugees now for over 40 years. It is historic in proportion. Um, that, that, that sacrifice does not go unnoticed. At the same time, we very much hope they work with the UNHCR as they enter this next phase where they're trying to figure out whether more people are returning, whether some of those who have returned are able to come back to Pakistan, and that those, the needs of those refugees are being met. Uh, thank you, and, and yes, I've raised this previously with the uh, ambassador, uh, Pakistani ambassador as well, and uh, look forward to working with you uh, to make sure that that happens. Uh, I'll shift gears again. Uh, we touched on this. I'll, I'll pick up where Mr. Lawler left off. Uh, Pakistan-Iranian relations, you mentioned the escalation, uh, the recent escalatory environment, the, the strikes in January. Um, where do you see that moving? Do you think the strikes were uh, one-off uh, occurrences or something that uh, could continue to escalate in the future? Sir, as you know, uh, the strikes uh, were not only against Pakistan, they were against three countries simultaneously by Iran. It, it is reprehensible and irresponsible for Iran to lash out against its neighbors for terrorism that exists in Iran itself. So uh, as you may, may be tracking, those three uh, missile and drone strikes that happened uh, in January followed a, a really terrible terrorist attack that occurred within uh, Iran. And the government of Iran clearly felt like it had to respond in some way. They responded in the worst way possible by firing missiles at targets that they probably didn't well understand, which for our information, ended up killing lots of civilians in three countries, including in right. Pakistan. And, uh, and with my last, we have strongly condemned Iran's actions. My last few seconds, can you just uh, touch on the, the U.S. messaging to the Pakistani, Pakistani government regarding their direct engagement with Tehran on security matters, especially in the context of our concerns, our mutual concerns of uh, nuclear proliferation and Iran's nuclear program? Sir, we have warned them about our red lines legislative, but also in terms of uh, how we cooperate with Pakistan. If they get into bed with Iran, it'll be very serious 
for our relationship. Okay, we need to reiterate that again and again and again. With that, I yield back. Thank you very much, Congressman Brad Schneider of Illinois. We now proceed to Congressman Corey Kassar, uh, Greg Kassar of Texas. Thank you, Chair, and thanks also to the ranking member for having me here today. Uh, Mr. Liu, I'm sure you're aware, I led a letter alongside 30 of my colleagues here in Congress to the State Department as well as to the President, you've got it right there, uh, talking about credible allegations of election rigging in the Pakistani elections, and we urged that the administration withhold recognition of the new government in Pakistan until a credible and transparent investigation on election interference had been conducted. I know that the U.S. Embassy congratulated Mr. Sharif, quote, on his assumption of the office of prime minister, but I haven't seen a statement yet from the State Department itself. So just so we're clear at this point, yes or no, has the U.S. officially recognized the new government in Pakistan? Uh, Representative Kesar, I would like to answer with the yes or no. The, the actual answer is a little more complicated, if you'll allow me. Uh, the, the government of the United States, we don't actually go around recognizing or withholding recognition of new governments. That's not something we do anywhere around the world. W what we do do is we decide whether we're going to engage with a government. Um, and so, yes, you have seen um, actions by our ambassador, our embassy. Uh, we are, in every interaction with this government, stressing the importance of accountability for election irregularities, sir. Can I just also add, your letter is incredibly important. It's important that the Pakistani people, the Pakistani government, hear not only from the administration, but from members of Congress, and having so many of them speak together uh, has real influence. We, the administration largely agrees with your recommendations. We have done many of the things that you have, um, have proposed. We have uh, said publicly and privately that we want to see transparent and credible investigation of election irregularities. We have called for accountability for mass detentions of people in the opposition, and we have said loudly and clearly that military trials for civilians accused of crimes after May 9th is not in keeping with international norms. I appreciate that, and so in other cases, for example, in the case of Venezuela or some other countries where the State Department has spoken out very clearly, about election rigging, and we can talk about, on, you know, separately about how it is that we treat those governments or treat those countries, but it seems that when we have had allegations of election rigging that we've spoken out much more, much more clearly than, than, than in this case, and I would urge that we t continue to speak with the level of moral clarity that we have um, in other situations. My, uh, but I appreciate your, your recognition and speaking out here today about how it's not okay for us to be having journalists jailed for 